I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, West Virginia Archives and History Library. Tonight we have David Rodmeiser, Rodmeiser, sorry about that. He will present a, an introduction to the Great Creek Mound Archaeological Complex, a West Virginia historic site, museum, and research center. Before I go any further into that, I'd like to uh, remind everybody of our upcoming lectures. We have one coming up on October 10th, and it'll be at 6 o'clock here in the library also. It's uh, Finding Hidden Ancestors, a Native American Perspective. Then on November 5th, the Battle of Charleston and the 1862 Canal Valley Campaign by our own uh, Terry Lowry. Then on uh, November 14th, the History of Charleston, the Modern Era, featuring Dr. Uh, Billy Joe Payton. Um, the, uh, the Great Creek Mound in Moundsville is one of the largest earthen burial mounds constructed by the Adena cultural tradition between 2000, or 250 and 150 BC. The seven acre tract has been owned by the state of West Virginia since 1909 and hosts the Delft Narona Museum and the West Virginia Archaeological Research and Collections Management Facility. David has been the site manager for the Great Creek Mound Archaeological Complex since 2009. He serves as West Virginia editor of the Council for Northeast Historical Archaeological Newsletter and serves on the advisory committee of the Cuttenay Farmstead, a project of the Marshall County Historical Society. Please welcome David. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's a good crowd, and I all feel very privileged and honored to be here to talk about a uh, facility that I'm very proud of, and that's a really, really neat job. I've been there since 2009, and it's been a dream job for me. I've been into archaeology since I was 16 years old, and being able to work in a place like this every day is just, is just uh, amazing. But you came here to learn about archaeology, and, um, and one reason I'm here tonight, of all nights, October 1st, is because October is West Virginia's archaeology month. So congratulations, <laughs> let, let, let the festivities begin. And in archaeology, we like to make discoveries, we like to, we like to find things, and if you would, very carefully, uh, sorry, but on the blue seats here, below the seal, you will find a little number, a little white tag with a number. Let's we'll see who has some discoveries tonight. Oh, I have one. Right here. There should be seven. Is there a number one? Who has number one? Sorry, number one. And here's your board run. <laughs> uh, number two. And just so you all know, we have a, we're giving you a book. This is our gift shop at Great Creek, uh, Mound Mills, Mammoth Mound, and a commemorative, uh, you know, it's all wrapped up, coffee mug. Great Creek. Archaeology and Archaeology Month are fun, so. <laughs> number three. Engineers um, uh, video on the archaeology at the uh, Marmot Lock and Dam project. Oh, That's courtesy of the Huntington District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And then the next one would be number five. You two have a video to call your own. Okay. And they're getting smaller. <laughs> I believe number six. Number six this is a lapel pin with the uh, Great Creek Mound Archaeological Complex. Thank you. And the last number. There you go. Wear it with pride. Said this is Archaeology Month, and why do we have Archaeology Month? Um, I think just over 37 states in the country celebrate Archaeology Month, and hopefully more will do it, because it's up to us to kind of get the word out that there is archaeology to create awareness and appreciation for archaeology. And you may not be aware of it, but West Virginia has a fabulous and terrific uh, archaeological heritage, and we need to get the word out more, because the survival and the future of archaeology depends on educating the public and the people to save sites and, and get funding for archaeology. It is a very labor-intensive uh, field. Okay. Oh, by the way, did we get to see the handouts that we came in? Should have gotten three handouts on your way in. If you didn't on your way out, please make sure you get these. Uh, one of them is uh, for the uh, Archaeology Month activities taking place in Great Creek Mound. We take Archaeology Month very serious up there. This coming Saturday, October 5th, from 12 to 4, we have our 21st annual Archaeology Day, and uh, it's it's family oriented. We'll have uh, someone there doing flint mapping. That is where they take a stone and make it into an arrow point or spear point. 
We'll have someone making pinch pots. We'll have uh, spear throwing and ladle throwing. And uh, so we have also uh, two ethnobotanists are going to be there. They will be floating dirt. You put, uh, put the dirt in water, and that's how you find seeds. The seeds will float out. You'll see how, that, how that's done. And uh, the Cockane House has had a lot of archaeology done. There'll be artifact displays. Uh, a couple of consulting firms will be there uh, having displays and exhibits. So please come to Grave Creek uh, this Saturday. And just so you know, for future reference, it's the first Saturday of, of October every year. So next year will be you know, the 22nd will be the, on the first Saturday. So we'll plug there. And then uh, we have a monthly lecture and film series at Grave Creek. And this year, uh, on October 24th, we have a uh, Dr. James Adabazio. Uh, he's on the History Channel, Discovery Channel. He's 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 big time, and he will be our speaker. Uh, for that program, and he'll be talking on the first uh, Floridians, early humans on the submerged uh, Gulf Coast of Florida, and that's a really fascinating talk, and you'll really like it, and he's a really neat speaker. He's the one that uh, the archaeologist that discovered did all the field work at uh, the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in uh, western Pennsylvania. No commercials there, right? Okay. So everyone is different. Okay. This is a uh, map, uh, probably the earliest map that we have for the uh, 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 Grave Creek area. Uh, this was done in 1843 by an anthropologist named Schoolcraft. And this is the Grave Creek Mound. This is the Ohio River. And this all in here is referred to as the as the Moundsville Flats. And it's about 2,000 acres. At one time, the Ohio River used to flow here, but over time, it, it migrated this way towards you know, present-day Ohio. And at one time, there were about seven uh, actual mounds in Moundsville. That's why they call it Moundsville. There's only one mound uh, left surviving. And there were earthworks and so forth in the area. But this is a very crucial uh, map that kind of documents what was there. Most of it's gone now, except for the, the big mound. And there were also uh, lookouts, and there's a lot of, been a lot of scholarly interest in these uh, for astro um, astronomy, uh, either lunar or, or solar uh, observation points and, and so forth. But uh, people are doing research on that. Hopefully, we'll, have, we'll learn more about it you know, in the years to come. And these are early woodcuts uh, that were done at the Great Creek Mound. Um, The mound was excavated in, uh, in, in 1838. Uh, the, the original owner did not want it touched. He wanted it protected. And uh, in 1838, uh, two tunnels were dug into the mound horizontally. Oops. Uh, here's the mound. A tunnel was dug in here. A tunnel was dug here. And then they did a shaft right down the middle, a 10-foot wide shaft. And in, in the mound, they found two tombs. Uh, both, both tombs were, were explored. And they, this was made into a tourist attraction. This is 1838. Uh, this was made into a tourist attraction trying to get you know, the uh, and uh, it's kind of neat that it was one of the first archaeological uh, tourist attractions. But it uh, only lasted for about 10 years. The, uh, the Rupa stuff started caving in on their uh, uh, tunnels and, and, and so forth. Now, the, the tunnel would go in there, and inside the mound, they had created this very large room where they had exhibits and displays. And um, you had to use candles to get in there and, and all. And then at the very top, there was a three-story observatory. And uh, there was a, spiral, a winding spiral staircase that went up to the very and this is a very common uh, uh, theme of a, of a woodcut, which, which changes from artist to artist. And the mound has a, uh, generally it's about a diameter of about 295 feet. And originally it was 68 feet um, tall. And it's probably the, one of the largest uh, Adena mounds uh, that there is. And it's been estimated that it took uh, about 57,000 tons of earth to, to build this mound. And you realize this mound was built one basket load at a time. 57,000 basket loads of dirt to build this. And I want to add, too, that uh, this mound has been known to a lot of people. Uh, Meriwether Lewis, when he was on his way to the Lewis and Clark uh, Corps of Discovery, he did stop and uh, uh, record it. And if you go to the website for uh, the Cultural History for this agency, uh, for this Archives of History, they have uh, reproduced uh, Meriwether um, Lewis's uh, description of the Great Creek Mound, which is a pretty, pretty elaborate, pretty detailed. And this was in 1803. And uh, Charles Dickens, you know the Christmas story? He, uh, he, he traveled down the Ohio River and uh, observed the people, the culture, and so forth. And he even uh, discussed the Great Creek Mound, which I think is kind of neat. And then uh, I think one of the first uh, written references to the Great Creek Mound was probably around 1773, 1774, just after uh, the Battle of Point Pleasant. And this is the oldest uh, known photograph of the Great Creek Mound. That's about 1858. So you can see the observatory on top. It's uh, three stories. And uh, when they did excavate the mound in 1838, supposedly they found this tablet. I think it's been shown to be a forgery or fake, but uh, there is a lot of interest in it. We do have an exhibit which kind of gives credibility to it, so we get a lot of questions about this. But uh, this is the, the Great Creek tablet, and that is a cast on the upper right-hand side. No one knows where the original is. Okay, this is an 1890s, about a 1910 uh, view of the mound. 
And it was after 1900, it was threatened with the destruction. The property owner um, inherited the land and, uh, in 1906, and by 1908, he, is, he was, uh, had planned to have it uh, demolished, just taken down, so he could use the land for, for, for black land purposes. The uh, DAR was in an uproar, and from 1906 to 1908, the DAR started a campaign to save the mound, and they secured an option to protect the mound, and uh, wanted to hold it until uh, options could be determined. Um, it's pretty amazing that, they, that there's that, that much interest in this mound. This was donated to us recently. Uh, in addition to the uh, DAR effort, uh, the state superintendent of, of schools for West Virginia at the time um, started a campaign throughout the whole school game, a mound day in November of 1908, and he asked the kids around, around the whole state of West Virginia to save pennies. And they raised about $1,400, and you know, at that, that time that was a lot of money. And uh, Governor Dawson, Governor Dawson uh, declared the mound will be preserved, and the state can kick in state monies, and they were able to acquire the mound for $20,000. And the state has owned it since 1909. And uh, sheet music, uh, this sounds pretty neat. I should have recorded it for you all. But Mound City, uh, around 1910, 1915, uh, a lot of businesses and so forth in, in Moundsville uh, were named Mound City, dry cleaners, Mound City, grocery, Mound City, bank, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this summer I had an intern uh, going through microfilm for all the newspapers for the area. I wanted to see day by day, week by week, uh, how was the mound being referenced. And that's one thing we noticed in the ads, that Mound City this, Mound City that. I don't know what happened, but now it's, it's no longer there. Uh, you used that much. But anyway. <clears throat> okay, this is a 1923 aerial photograph of Moundsville. By the way, question I should have asked. Who has been to Grave Creek Mountain? Okay. Who has never heard of Grave Creek Mountain until you heard about this meeting? <laughs> okay. All right. No, it's in Moundsville. I should have asked it earlier, but everyone's who's heard, heard of the, uh, the historic uh, penitentiary, the state prison? Okay. All right. That's all we can keep looking. This right here is the prison right here. I remember it fondly. Okay. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this, is, this is the prison, and here is, here is the mound. Now, this is 1923. And I'm trying to point out some things that will mean, have, have meaning later on, but uh, this is a, like a whole block here. This, this, the state of West Virginia has owned this right here since 1909. And after the state acquired it, since the prison was next door, they gave control, the state board of control gave uh, 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 stewardship of the mound to the warden with the state pen. So from 1909 until 1960s, the prison oversaw maintenance and upkeep of the mound. But they planted maple, these are maple trees along the edge here. They did a flagstone walk, and a flagstone walk goes around here. You can see how large some of the trees are. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. On that which side was the Ohio River? I'm sorry, the Ohio River is right there. Oh, uh, he's trying to orient. Yes, that is Ohio River. This is, uh, this is uh, the prison again. This is Jefferson Avenue, the main street in, in Moundsville. And again, this is. Yeah. And around 1915, this is a uh, view of some of the uh, uh, adornments that were, you know, enhancements that were taking place. Now, based on what the intern learned this summer, by looking at the newspaper, the state acquired this in 1909. In 1910, the people were writing editorials to the paper. They were very upset because the state came in, they bought this, they cut all the trees off of it, and it started to erode. And then the state lose no money, became anything else, you know, for a while. So, mm -hmm. but you can see that um, the, the, there's very few trees on the mound, relatively speaking. But if you look, there's a pattern. Every 50 years, we do some tree cutting on the mound. Uh, this was around 1910, late 50s they cut trees, and then two years ago they cut trees. So there's like every 50 years, there's a little cycle there. Um, <clears throat> But again, there's a the Flagstone walkway I was talking about. And these are um, uh, mulberry trees. And if you go to Grave Creek, I, I, I would love to get a sign for this, but this tree right here is still there. And next to the mound is the second oldest element on the property. Hmm. And uh, you'll see here it is right here. Anyway, this is uh, around nine. Uh, I have contradictories. We need to do a lot more research needs to be done on, on this property. I mean, we know bits and pieces, you think that we know it all, but a lot of research has yet to be done. One source tells me this is 1915, another source tells me it's 1930s. It's like, what is it? Anyway, it was built by local, it was built by the inmates, uh, you know, using uh, uh, penal architecture, and I guess you could call it vernacular institutional architecture. And uh, this was built by the inmates, and it was called, it was like the early mail museum, but uh, the inmates were able to sell uh, handmade crafts and so forth in this uh, facility. And they kind of, I kept an eye on the mail, I guess. And then in 1944, uh, things started to heat up a little bit. Uh, in terms of wanting to make things happen. Uh, let me go back again. This, uh, they started this own building and, and it probably sits uh, unfinished for about 10 years. And then another uh, warden came in and he got all fired up and he, he wanted to make some changes. And his name, this warden's name, you like this, it's M.E. Ketchum. <laughs> M.E. Ketchum, come on, that's the other one. 
But uh, Lee Ketchum, he, uh, he was awarded in 1941, and he pushed to get, the, uh, uh, to get this finished. And then in 1946, the Miss for, uh, West Virginia uh, beauty pageant was held in Moundsville. And some 25,000 people came to Moundsville, and this was a great opportunity. Oh my gosh, and they had a special archaeological exhibit that was part of the overall like, things to see and do in Moundsville. And that helped get a lot of, uh, of uh, traction for uh, doing something more with the mound. And this was two years before that, but things were starting to happen. At one point, they were trying to get the National Park Service interested to come in and, and take over the mound for its operation. These maps are really neat. Um, again, here's the prison. Here's the big prison wall. This is Jefferson Avenue. And this is their mound right here. And these are the, these are the maple trees that were planted. And this is the Blackstone walkway, and this is the steps that go up to the very top of, of the mound. And what they had proposed to do, this is 1944, what they wanted to do, because this is how it, is, how it was then and there, 1944, this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to acquire all these houses and make it into a larger park. In the late 60s, that's what happened. So, but what's interesting is, uh, we used our interns again, going through the microphone this summer. Uh, in 1911, they were talking about doing this back, it's that early, about taking the houses down to create a, uh, you know, the, green, uh, the green space around the mound. And this is a, a view, of the, uh, again, with uh, Jimmy Ketchum and, and things really taking off. We had a local delegate, uh, Thomas Wilkinson, in 1949, uh, push the Board of Control to let's do more with this property. And he had the, uh, the prison system expand the size of the uh, Mound Museum. And they expanded. The original mound was, uh, the original building was right here. They added onto the sides and they added onto the back. They made, made it a lot larger. And this is uh, 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 where restrooms were, utility building. And everybody talked about the mulberry bush. Right there's the mulberry bush. And if you look at old pictures and so forth of the exhibits in the uh, Mount Museum, they're like, oh my gosh, these are incredible, uh, good quality and so forth. As it turns out, the uh, uh, Carnegie Museum, uh, James, Dr. James Walker, was, uh, uh, and um, um, Mayor Oaks, an archaeologist, the uh, Carnegie Museum was providing uh, display cases for the museum, and they were also providing technical support for how to you know, write descriptions and captions and so forth. So it was a, it was a very, you know, a museum ahead of its time, uh, especially in the location and all. And this is a newspaper uh, article here in the archive. This is Jimmy Griffin. He was the head of the uh, uh, Museum of Anthropology at the University of Ann Arbor. He was a he became a, a living legend in, in, in archaeology and, and some other folks there too. Um, there's this fellow, um, uh, Del Corona, this guy right here. He was a catalyst for so much of what happened uh, with with the Great Creek Mound, and that's why we call the museum the Del Corona Museum. This guy, he from the 40s to I guess the 70s, and he just talked to people, he brought people in, and, and here's an example of what, of what he's doing. Uh, in the 1970s, now no, no archaeology had been done at Grave Creek until uh, the 1970s, uh, 1975 and 1976. Um, I don't consider what was done in 1938 as archaeology. They have to be there more treasure hunters just, you know, looking for something. This is the first real archaeology we had uh, done in 1975 and 1976. They dug, slot, they dug these slot trenches, this is called a slot trench, around the, uh, the mound because it had been early accounts had given reference that there should be a moat that was around that surrounded uh, most of the mound. And if you look very carefully, you can see the little dip right there. And they did a number of these uh, slot trenches around the mound, and sure enough, it was a moat, 40 feet wide, 4 to 5 feet deep, and had a center line of 910 feet if you went around uh, the mound. So that was kind of neat. They were able to verify that. And they also took a core drill, they went on, on the sides of the mound and drilled down into it, took out soil samples, and from that, they were able to determine that the mound was built in at least three successive stages over time. So it wasn't all built at one time. They, they, they uh, built the mound, was there for a while, they added to it. And What's interesting, they were able to determine that uh, some of the later stages of, of the mound being built up was used to fill from the moat was, was added to the mound. Ironically, in 1838, they were able to figure out, too, when they dug the tunnels into the mound, in the, you know, the three tunnels, the backfill from all that was used to fill the moat up. So the soils uh, kind of moved around. So it's kind of a neat little story there. And during this work, we were able to get carbon dates, uh, uh, C14 samples. That's how we know the, generally the, the mound dates to 250 to 150 BC. Okay, this is another view. There's your, your prison in the background. And uh, this is the things that you see the trees are gone. Uh, this is our mound museum. And this right here was, this is the West Virginia tradition big time. Uh, this is it's a symbol of the state of West Virginia. It's an outline of the state of West Virginia. And um, they use uh, glass, call it broken glass to kind of highlight it. And then over here is another outline of the state of West Virginia that was done in flowers. And uh, just kind of neat. Anyway, I'm just showing you this because things will change now eventually. Uh, this, again, the state has had this since 1909. And this is probably 1950s, 60s photograph. But you can see them, how tall the maple trees are. 
1923, they were much lower. Now they're, they're, they're grown a little bit 20 years later. And the state has had this since 1909. And then in the late 60s, 30 parcels of, of city uh, land were acquired. This was, this was all taken over in a domain that they didn't sell out, they were taken. And uh, these houses were all torn down, and this was made into uh, the present uh, confines of our, of our facility, which, they, which is the same thing they had proposed in 1944. This is a view of probably uh, around 1980 of, of, of the area. Um, here's our, our Mount Museum, the small utility building. And the moat uh, would have been around here. This is the uh, Del Carmona Museum. And later on, we talked about a fence. But this is, this is a, a fence that we replaced two years ago. So we're done in a second. And in 1944, the uh, inmates built a stair system that went up the mountain. You could walk up on top of the mountain on the stairs that were built in 1944. Okay, and this is how that looks today. Uh, by the way, the, the uh, museum opened in 1978, and this opened 2,000 years ago. Uh, <laughs> And when it opened in 1978, it was, uh, it was operated by the city of Moundsville, Marshall County, and the state in a cooperative uh, type of venture. But by uh, the city and the county, uh, by 1996, were unable to uh, uh, maintain it. And um, actually, 86, 1986, it went to DNR, and it became an official state park. And it was a state park until 1996. In 1996, it was transferred to the West Virginia Division of Culture and History, where it, where it is today. And uh, I should have mentioned as well earlier that. Uh, Great Creek now, we are one of four historic sites in the Division of Culture and History, and we are in the museum section, and uh, Charles Morris is the director of state museums. He's my direct supervisor. And this right here is Team Great Creek. Uh, in terms of uh, public servants, you, you couldn't ask for better working uh, people. You can come to Great Creek now anytime. Every one of these people will be working from the time they clock in until they go home. Uh, I'm proud of them. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great team to work with. And until July 1, we were open seven days a week. And that's, that's a small staff, okay, to keep it open seven days a week. And they do, they do great work. Up here, upper left-hand corner, that's Andrea Keller. She's our cultural program coordinator, better yet, an educator. Uh, works with school groups and tour groups and, and, and activities, things like that. Uh, this is uh, Heather Klein, our lead curator. Amanda Brooks, our curator. Uh, this is Cindy Dennis. She's our accountant that also heads up the gift shop. And then John Boyke, uh, we call him the diver. He's our uh, building maintenance supervisor. I'm serious. He, Left, no matter what it is, he can, he can fix it, he can get it running. He, the guy is amazing. He's phenomenal. The whole staff is phenomenal. And we are open year round. Um, our current hours are Tuesday through Saturday, um, 9 to 5. This, the mail is kind of neat uh, in, in the wintertime. It's, uh, I had a survey recently, and it depends on where you measure from as to how tall it is, uh, just under 60. And this is inside the Delta Road Museum. These are of the archaeological exhibits. And the uh, overall Delta Road Museum is about 26,000 square feet. And uh, most of these exhibits uh, date to uh, the 19, around 1980. And uh, uh, Commissioner Randall Reed Smith is working to get us funds to upgrade our exhibits to make them you know, refresh them a little bit. They are, they are, they are old. Uh, anyway, it's a very nice museum. It's very spacious. And um, Like, there's an architectural form name for this type of architecture. It's like grotesque or something. Like that. Oh, yeah. Never mind, I'll pull that on you. Uh, we also have uh, uh, rotating uh, cultural exhibits, uh, temporary cultural exhibits at the uh, upper, our main gallery area. These are exhibits that typically will be here at the Culture Center. And then once they leave the Culture Center, they'll, they'll go to Grave Creek. Uh, upper left, we have a, home, a very large Homer Laughlin collection, a lot of purse pieces. Um, that's the estuary there. Uh, upper right, we have Ron Hinkle. He's a contemporary glass artisan, um, and uh, there's some of his works uh, there. Bottom right, we have Marble King. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, they still make marbles uh, here in the U.S., just south of uh, Mountville and Payton City. And that's a, a marble mural. That's like 50-some thousand, maybe 52,000 marbles are in that mural. And on the left, we have uh, the fashion dolls of uh, Pete Ballard. Uh, and it kind of shows the, the evolution of, of fashion through uh, the costumes of the 19th century. <coughs> And because we are part of the Division of Culture and History, this is an extension of, of that. This is our number one activity. I think uh, any archaeological park, this is a staple. It's uh, at lateral throwing, spear throwing, and it's something, it's ageless. I mean, people love to do it. It's just so much fun. You come there next this coming Saturday for Archaeology Day. This Saturday, you can throw it at lateral. It's, it's uh, really cool. In fact, uh, for the 150th uh, celebration of West Virginia's birthday, 
uh, the state government moved to Wheeling, and we had uh, a number of senators and delegates that came to Great Creek, and they also enjoyed doing this. It's kind of nice to see everybody throwing, throwing the spears and stuff. And we do have a number of uh, um, uh, programs throughout the year. Upper left, that's uh, we have a lecture and film series every month for four years now. We either have a lecture or a film, and it's typically the last Thursday, unless there's a holiday or something like that. And we typically average 30 to 50 people. We're starting to get a following of people that come every month, and um, uh, we try and uh, provide uh, interesting speakers. And the handouts I was talking about, we do have a list there of, of our uh, folks. And we almost have 2014 lined up, ready to go. So we try to get a few six months to a year ahead uh, with that as people can plan accordingly. Uh, or right, that's Travis Henline. I think he spoke here before, how to speak Cherokee, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, Right here, archaeologists, we do not dig dinosaurs, but uh, you would be amazed at people that bring rocks in, they bring fossils in, and what is this, what is this? But I feel kind of bad that all we can say is we can't help you with that. So what we've done is we have a handout that we'll give people that we can't help you, but this is the contact information for the West Virginia Geological Survey. Because we're in the Northern Panhandle, here's information for Pennsylvania and Ohio, and also there's a West Virginia Fossil Club. So we kind of you know, provide that for them. And going a step further, we say, well, tell you what, if you can hold on to your fossils twice a year, we have a fossil ID day. And that's become a huge success, and we get like 80 to 100 people to come in. And sometimes they'll, they'll go bring parts with just you know, stuff they have found. And pretty amazing. And then uh, uh, the whole uh, the drill punches uh, there, kids on the bottom right, watching like, that. And we do get uh, quite a few school groups uh, throughout the year, the spring and in the uh, fall. And these are some scenes from uh, past. By the way, these slides look very greenish or yellow or something. Um, this is, these are from past archaeology um, uh, days. That's uh, Bob Walden, he's kind of a staple there. He should have had the Clinton and things like that. And we have an interpretive garden. This is the fourth year that we've had the interpretive garden. Andrea Keller, she's our cultural program coordinator. She loves gardening, and this is her. She is so passionate about this. And uh, again, this is the fourth year. We have the John Marshall High School Horticulture um, Club that comes out and helps to prepare the garden. The uh, master gardeners of Marshall County help out. We have just various volunteers. The hard part is getting people to stay with us during the summer to keep the thing weeded. Because it's, it's a major a major thing. And the types of crops that we grow, we, we grow crops that um, archaeological evidence has documented for the region. And that's typically the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And uh, and corn, but the Adena did not, did not have corn. So this is not an Adena garden. This is just a, you know, a synthetic type of, a type of interpretive garden. But anyway, a lot of kids had never seen corn plants before. And the sunflowers this year with all the rain we had, it was amazing, the little finches, the butterflies, the bees. It was really, we need to be out there. Also, we went and uh, got this uh, signed up with uh, First Lady uh, Obama's uh, uh, Let's Move Health Initiative to encourage uh, you know, healthy eating and so forth. And we try and tie that into working with school groups. And, trying, you know, and, and, this, and this is a, a living exhibit, by the way, too. This is a, it's a unique type of exhibit. And uh, we kind of watch the plants grow. And, and then uh, during one activity Andrea has for uh, kids, they can uh, plant a sunflower seed that we save the sunflower seeds. And the kids can come in and play in the little cup, take it home and watch it grow. Uh, this is our holiday tree. Okay, it's not a Christmas tree, it's not a Kwanzaa tree, it's not a Thanksgiving tree, it's a it's a holiday tree. We put it up before Thanksgiving and we take it down probably late January. And if you look carefully, it's all the stuff we we dry the uh, the vegetables and stuff from the garden, the beans, the corn, uh, the corn tassels and so forth, and, uh, and the boards. It's a very, very unique um, uh, type of tree. We get a lot of people coming to look at it. But that'll be coming up, uh, you know, something to do over the holidays and it's slow. Be great for you to get our holiday tree. And again, we have the gift shop for those that had the three bags. That's what the mug looks like if you want. So there you go. All right, this is uh, until 2008, West Virginia never had a home for its archaeological collections. There was no place in West Virginia where you could take, if you were an archaeologist doing a project, there's nowhere you could take the artifacts to be curated. And uh, with federal laws and so forth uh, for highways and bridges and pipelines and so forth, they're, they're required to do archaeology, but the artifacts have to reside in the state where they were dug up, but there's no more for them to go. So um, through the efforts of uh, uh, Senator Byrd, I uh, really like Senator Byrd, we, had a, we were able to get a Save America's Treasures grant, and we were able to construct a state-of-the-art 9,600 square foot collections management facility uh, that was added on to the Delta Road Museum. And uh, we do our best to adhere to federal curation standards, which are 36 CFR Part 79, and that's climate control, security, I mean, all the whole nine yards. And that's uh, something you also be very, very proud of. And this is not typically open to the public. However, <clears throat> this coming Saturday on Archaeology Day, we do have tours during the day where our curators will let you get a behind the scenes look at the at this. You gotta realize that the reason we can't let the public in there all the time is we only have two curators. 
And for the past, what, 40, 50 years, some 2,000 boxes accumulated, and these have to be processed. I mean, the artifacts have to be washed, they have to be labeled, they have to be cataloged, and, and they're too busy working and stuff like that to be you know, to stop and talk to people. But we do want to make it accessible, and we do it throughout the year, and archaeology day is one time that you can uh, do that. Uh, on the upper right, you see those are the brown boxes, those are the bad boxes. Those are full of acid. That's, that's the way a lot of the older um, collections look. These boxes here, these are um, acid-free boxes. And in fact, these are, uh, uh, these are West Virginia boxes. This is made, these are made by the Hollinger Box uh, Company. And typically the boxes used to be, you would get three boxes on there. But what they did was they worked with us, well, prior folks, and came up with a design to maximize the space. And they came up with a special box called the West Virginia Box so we can maximize our space. Uh, these are state-of-the-art uh, mobile uh, storage units. These things move. They're, they go back and forth. They maximize the use of space. And um, again, it's all climate control. And this is what a rehouse collection looks like. Um, kind of hard to see there, but come to Great Creek next Saturday. You can look at an example of some of this stuff. Okay, and uh, we do have what we call an observation room, where you can, it's like uh, the Carnegie had that for a lot of museums have it now, where you can go and look into a lab and see what's going on. I'm standing in the observation room looking into uh, the lab where the two curators are talking to a college class. And by the way, I have a policy that anytime a, a college uh, class, especially like an archaeology class or something, or, or uh, archaeology companies working in the area, we will do what we can to give them a tour of, of it. See, West Virginia, we suffer in that we don't have a, a graduate program in archaeology. A lot of, most of your states do have graduate programs in archaeology, and it's your graduate students that do the research on this stuff, okay? And uh, that way, what can I do my thesis on or my, you know, whatever? There's always something to work on. So I'm trying to get the word out. We want to get the word out so that we do have collections here, wonderful collections that need to be looked at. And so I'm trying to you know, kind of spread the word through the grapevine that, that we have uh, wonderful collections here. And we probably have millions of artifacts, okay? Probably millions of artifacts. And uh, uh, we did not have a uh, survey. We, last uh, June, we had a major breakthrough. We were given permission to have our own uh, computer server. Um, so now we can back up our data. And that we, you can, once you start, you can never lose your information. And we were very, very fortunate to get permission to um, have that. Okay, this, uh, we have, been, have, have developed a wonderful working relationship with the uh, West Virginia University Native American Studies program. Uh, about three years ago, we partnered up with them, the National Park Service, and some other uh, park folks, and uh, a Metacroft Rock Shelter, and had a, uh, um, uh, like a seminar, like, like a day of talks and so forth, and, and information, and talking about how best Native peoples can tell their story. How, you know, how are we doing, are we doing a good job, and so forth. And uh, this is uh, uh, Gerard Baker, he's from out west, and he was the uh, first Native American, uh, Native American to be a park superintendent at, um, uh, it was Custer Battlefield, now it's Little Bighorn uh, National Park. And he came there and we were very, very honored with his presence. And then last year, uh, this is Bonnie Brown. She's the uh, coordinator for the uh, Native American Studies program at WVU. And uh, this year, these folks all came in and they volunteered for a whole week to help us uh, you know, march artifacts and move boxes and, and things like that. And then this past year, uh, Bonnie was able to get with Darla Spencer She's with the uh, Cultural Resource Analyst Incorporated Archaeology Company, and also she's with the West Virginia Archaeological Society. And we were able to uh, qualify for a uh, major grant from the West Virginia Humanities Council, and we were able to bring these folks down for a whole week, and we set up a dorm, type of setting anyway, cabins at the Grand View Park, and that was their dorm, and every day they would come in, and all day long it was just a huge flurry of activity. And uh, they helped during the day. We had, we had films at night. We had to have a public education component. And then on Saturday we had an incredible uh, symposium of speakers we were able to bring in and talk about archaeology and uh, it's on YouTube now and uh, um, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, for, sat for, the, for the symposium we uh, had a PowerPoint that was put together as we went along and I could have some help with my assistants. <laughs> so, uh, this was a very quickly done uh, PowerPoint slideshow, but this will give you a little, a little feel for um, what went on with, with that week. It was a very, very uh, intensive week.
it's a little long, but anyway, it was an incredible week. There's just so much going on. And, and, uh, you have to realize, again, uh, West Virginia has never had a uh, collections facility for its artifacts for all these years, and we are so backlogged that people can't start doing research. We don't know what we have when we get this stuff processed and labeled and rebagged and so forth. So things like this are, are a huge, huge shot in the arm. Um, we do have other volunteers to help out. Right now, we're kind of maxed out with volunteers. Right at the moment, we have uh, four interns um, that, are, that are assisting us. Um, we have one that's uh, 40 hours a week. She's from Mansfield State uh, University and uh, about five or six hours away in Pennsylvania. And on her own dime, she's uh, staying in Moundsville and she's uh, just to get the experience and so forth. And then we have a West Liberty University intern, and then we have two interns from uh, Ohio University Eastern Campus. And then over the summer, we had a full-time Ohio University uh, Eastern Campus uh, volunteer as well, helping 40 hours a week. That's not like a lot, but it, it's huge when you get people wanting to come in there and you know, volunteer their time. You get experience in helping us, and you know it's, it's educating people, and it's just a good thing, a good thing to have. And I'm proud of it. And uh, again, what they're working on is, is the backlog. I call it the legacy collection. Those are the things that we've kind of inherited over time. Whenever collections come in now, with from archaeological consulting firms or whatever, it's referred to as being shelf ready. We have curation standards, and they come in already. All we just check it, make sure it looks good. It goes on the shelf. We take the CD, we put it in the server. And Good to go. We're just kind of going back and uh, collecting uh, where we need to be. Uh, our counterparts in Maryland, their facility, they have like a staff of 17 people. We have two people, and theirs has been around for maybe 20 or 30 years. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're, we're processing. And these are a few of the volunteers that have, that have helped us uh, in, in the past couple of years. Uh, it's really <coughs> it's great people are willing to do this. And uh, this lady up at the upper left, uh, that's Christine Dragu. Uh, her husband was the uh, um, esteemed archaeologist, uh, Dr. Don Dragu. He was the uh, curator of archaeology at the Carnegie Museum for many, many years, and he spent most of his career working on doing research on the Adena. He's published a book, uh, Mounds for the Dead, and so forth, and uh, he passed away, and she was concerned. A lot of times archaeologists pass away that their, their personal libraries and papers get scattered to the four winds. She wanted to keep his, his collection, his books together intact, and look all around the country for a place, and we had a brand new facility. We had a library. It was, a, it was a perfect match, and uh, we got about 2,000 books, and uh, it's pretty much every major archaeological publication from the 1950s through uh, mid-1980s. And uh, we're getting a lot of support from the folks here at Archive of History, especially Susan Scores, with how to properly catalog the books and so forth, and, and uh, we're getting those processed. But anyway, we have to stamp the books. And, and uh, <clears throat> no two days at that place are the same. Upper left, that was last weekend, we had a, a Cub Scout group with their parents and friends, you know, and then we always have people go have with the mail and stop for a, for a picture. And the upper right there, we have a, an antique car club. They like to stop there every year. Bottom left, uh, there's a lot of films are made at the prison, and they like to use our mound for you know filming purposes. And uh, who's the new Batman scroll? Anyway, some well-known people have known us. So, um, where we're at right at the prison. Upper right hand side, th th those guys are orkin. Those are orkin exterminators. Uh, we had uh, a very unusual species of brown burrowing bees. That, I mean, the guy, they were going crazy. I mean, my whole career, I've, I've never seen this. This is amazing. And they were on their phone talking to other bee people. And, and uh, we had, but anyway, they, 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 uh, they had their own little burrow, and they intimidated the heck out of the guests. We had to get rid of the bees, you know. So they had to spray the whole thing. And then another thing we had to deal with, uh, what happens when you get a ground hog on a mound in the city, okay? So we had to uh, have uh, critter control come in, you know, catch and release, take it somewhere else. But that's something uh, to deal with. There's little things you don't think about. And then uh, I've worked in tourism before, and then a lot of times in visitor centers, you keep a little secret notebook of the strange things people say, you know. And I think the classic for here is, why did they build the mound so close to the prison? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, and then we had one, one person thought that, that the mound was, was built to, for the inmate, when the inmates died in the prison, that's where they buried them. <laughs> we can go hold a book on things like that. <laughs> and then another thing I found out, I uh, a lot of people do not realize that West Virginia is a state. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's like, just, you know, it's, anyway, just dealing with the public and stuff, it's just amazing. It's, it's a fun experience. Uh, we are stewards of, of, of our facility. Um, uh, anytime, uh, the Great Creek Mound is on the National Register. The Great Creek Mound is a national historic landmark that it's, it's up there. And uh, any time they do any type of uh, construction, uh, ground disturbing, we have to monitor it to make sure nothing important is going to be uh, potentially important to be disturbed. In this case, uh, oops, uh, Appalachian Power was going to put a, uh, uh, a very power line. And we have a 1970s 
power it keeps breaking every year, it blows up, they have to go out and dig it up. And so what they're going to do is they're going to dig a trench along the white line there and put conduit and then run the, the uh, power line through instead of having to dig our yard up every year. So we did archaeology along this. This is where those houses were in the 1960s, so it was disturbing. But sometimes in archaeology, you can get little pockets of intact stuff. You never know. That's why we do archaeology. Now, one thing we did find in all the archaeology that's been done in recent years around Great Creek Mound uh, with monitoring, <coughs> lots of marbles, marbles, and glass marbles in particular. And maybe because of a story of glass was there, maybe that was a little sad thing. They would make marbles to take back to the kids or something. Or, I don't know. Uh, we did have a, uh, an archaeology company come in and do archaeology. This is our old fence of uh, the 1970s. It was starting to rust and so forth. But we wanted to make sure before we dug new post holes, we wanted to find out what were there any sensitive areas uh, in, uh, on the property. That's what we were looking for. We also removed some trees. Remember I talked about the maple trees in 1923 and so forth. There, here's the remnant of those trees up along here. And uh, accident waiting to happen. All three trees were, hot, were, were rotten on the inside. And really big maples do that, so they could have been a liability. So we, well, with the new fence going up, we did, there was a little break, break right here. When these branches come down, they, you know, they, they don't do good things to fences. So we, we didn't, didn't want to invest in a new fence and have these damn, uh, dangerous trees there. And, uh, but I believe that you should remove a tree, you should plant a tree. So. And another thing too is uh, uh, when I took this, before this upper left picture was taken, you could not see the mound. When I first was there in 2009, I had two friends from Virginia that came to visit me. They drove by the place several times and never saw the mound because it was covered by trees. Remember every 50 years we've got trees there. And so it was covered up and then something I never thought about, but when you have all that tree cover, the sunlight can't get through to the mound, therefore the grass can't grow, therefore we have exposed soil, and when you have rain coming in, you have what they call sheet erosion. Really microscopic erosion taking place over time. So that's you want you want sunlight on your on your mound. This uh, oops, this tree right here on the left looked like that before we gave it a little haircut. So see now the sunlight can get in there. And uh, the consulting firm they came through and did. We, we didn't know exactly where the fence post was going to be, so they uh, we did the archaeology work on the general area of where the fence would go. And then when the actual fence was dug itself, we knew exactly who put the space and who got the contract and what type of fence they would use. They were able to go out and mark with paint where each, each post hole would go. So we would do archaeology on every one of those in sensitive areas. And this, this will show you what you thought of do archaeology. We started out right here, boom, I hit something, hit rock. And then we expanded it. There's where I started out. And this is what it is, um, right there. And for the, in order for the fence post to go there, to dig the post hole, the fence post, they would have had to either shatter the rock or else just pull the whole thing apart. And obviously, it's some type of, of, of structural feature. As it turns out, uh, there's a corner right here going in, these little posts. And there's a step, I pull it up right here, you see the steps, and that, there it is. So, um, anyway, it's like kind of doing archaeology of archaeology, in a way. And so what we did was, we, this is over a weekend, I was by myself, it was February, it was cold, and uh, we made a command decision. So I uh, exposed it, and then covered it back, and then I put these up here. And they were, see the fence post was supposed to go right here, so they, they put one here, they put one here, so this is now preserved for future generations should there ever be a need for it, but, you know, this is archaeology in action. This is why we do archaeology. Sometimes you think, why would the heck would be there? Because it was right along the, uh, the road over here. So it's kind of neat. Uh, another example of that, we were getting to the deadline with uh, the defense people to get their work done, so the whole staff came out there. Um, the educator, Andrea, she's got a background in archaeology. In fact, she and I used to work together back in the 90s. Amanda's an archaeologist, and Heather's an archaeologist, so we all, we have to put the archaeology hat on and, and do things like that. Uh, these are examples of some of the uh, uh, profiles of the units that we dug. Um, this right here, uh, the closer you got to the mound, I don't know if you can see it, but there's like little lines, faint little lines. That's sheet erosion coming off the mound over, over time. And that right there is a textbook example of, of what happens when you, you know, don't let grass grow on your mound. The other thing too I want to add that we no longer, they have to weed eat our mound once a month, but we no longer do it that close. We now let it be about five or six inches off the ground to add, add more stability uh, to the mound. Uh, the upper left, that this is an iron pipe that kind of went everywhere they dug. We found this iron pipe. It's either water or gas or something old uh, uh, pipe there. Now this is the one I really thought was neat. Uh, <clears throat> most of the ground up there is 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 is, 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 is somewhat disturbed. But this right here, uh, remember uh, one picture I showed you? There's, there was some corn in 1910 growing next to the mound. This right here is a plow uh, for uh, we had the old plow one wall. And I thought that was just so neat. And uh, so this right here is an in, in, in intact you know uh, soil there. This is all filled in from. Since the states, you know, the inmates, I guess, brought in dirt and so forth. That's what all this is. But that's a whole plow scar. It's kind of neat seeing that. And then there's a retaining wall uh, on one side of the mound, and we dug this in just to make sure that anywhere the post went, we had to do archaeology to make sure nothing would be impacted. If it was, we would document it. 
it there. And it's there. Any questions? Yes. Oh, well, that's the irony of it all. We found thousands and thousands of artifacts, uh, but maybe, maybe five or six prehistoric artifacts in every place. It's, uh, there's been so much historic activity taking place uh, there over the years, and I think they brought in a lot of dirt. And then we do know that uh, maybe um, at one point the mound had, had um, you know, when the tunnel had all collapsed, it was like a volcano you know, in terms of the hollow, and they estimated probably 50 dump truck loads of uh, dirt were brought in and filled there. So it's, it's been landscaped quite a bit. So but there are little pockets, I'm sorry. So was a mound hollow? Oh, no, no. Originally, they, um, they uh, had a cleared area. They dug a hole. They, they did a, a log uh, tomb, like a, a crypt, and they, and, they, and they put dirt over it. And then maybe 100 years later, they built another tomb on top of that mound, and then uh, built the that. It was not hollow. It, it was hollow when they, when they dug the two horizontal tunnels right. into it, right. and then they came down the middle. So whoever went in there dug the tunnels to the tunnel. Yes, they did. They, they did. Okay. Yes. But trying to figure out exactly how many individuals, that's, but they, they, these weren't trained archaeologists, so they, they didn't take these records of Trying to figure out, you know, this is 1838, by the way, and we don't know where the artifacts are. By the way, a lot of people come in there thinking the whole museum is for the Great Creek Mound. Yes, sir. Yeah, where does the name Great Creek come from? Good boy. Uh, it's been around since uh, the 1700s, uh, uh, and maybe because I think I've seen reference to whatever the cell when, when they, my folks would see the uh, mounds. Those were, those were uh, Indian Indian graves, perhaps, and because there was such a, such a concentration of them there at uh, uh, the Great Creek Flats. That's where it came from. Uh, we gave the book away, the Delphi Runner's book, uh, Man with Mound. Uh, Delphi spent a lot of time looking at first person travel accounts and so forth, and collecting you know, what, what people describe, what they saw, and so forth. It's a little contradictory at times, but you know, there was a lot, a lot of stuff there that is no longer there. Uh, it's it's kind of sad, all we have now is just one mound. But. Anything on the Ohio side? Uh, the observation points or something like that? I think the one on the Ohio side was, um, was um, taken out with the power line a few years ago. We don't know who the modern day uh, descendants are. Not that much research has been done with our DNA and so forth. And another revelation, too, that's taking place is um, I'm not an expert enough to speak on it, but uh, there may not be an Adena culture per se, it's more of an Adena cultural tradition, and where you can have like different types of, of peoples, but they have something common among them. And in this case, it would be, it would be the mounds. Okay. But again, I'm not, my background is profession here, historical archaeology, more than, more than prehistory. I could try and help you find I'm sorry? That's why you like finding that step. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, I would love to have found that, you know. Uh, so what you're saying is Adina is more of a description of their cultural uh, living and not their DNA as a human race. Is that? I think so, yes. I just wanted to mention, I know the Adena were not corn growers based upon what you said, but did you know that two corn cobs found at Metacroft were dated to around 950 BC? Earliest corn in the region were two cobs, 16 row cobs found at Metacroft, very much before the time that we think of corn coming into the Ohio Valley, which is around 800 AD and then right. cultural common about 1200 AD. So it's odd, nobody knows why, but 16 row cobs of corn at two different spots. One was like 974 BC dated, and one was 930 something BC or something like that. So around 950 BC. Pretty daggone early. <laughs> and those are about people who were not agrarians. Right, right. So where did they get the corn and why did they carry it so far? <laughs> right. Just an interesting story. I can shed a little light on the place name question. Uh, the creek in the area was named Grave Creek after the mound, which was referred to as an Indian grave. And that dates from around 1817. It's the first time it appeared in writing as a place name. And the area was called Grave Creek, and it was called Grave Creek Mound up until about 1855. And after that, starting in 1850, well, a little earlier than that, in 1853, they began calling the, the community Moundsville. Ask a reference librarian. <laughs> Oh, um, what, when, when they acquired, question, uh, when they acquired uh, the property with the expansion of the, the park, they got the 30 uh, city tracks, 
Uh, that was phase one. Phase two would have started um, where they stopped, they would have gone all the way down to the Ohio River, taking out businesses and houses and so forth, and they would have made it into a large green space and they would want to reconstruct some of the earthworks. And that would have been amazing. Uh, um, came to day, but I mean, it would have been hard for Pardon? It's off the table. I would imagine so, yes. Oh, yes. It would be cost prohibitive. But if someone was very visionary, I mean, to build that museum and, that, and to do all that, you would think that way. Oh, all the time, and that's, that's what you know, that we do archaeological surveys. And if you do know of archaeological sites, you know, you, you should contact the Historic Preservation Office here, you know, at the Culture Center, and record it, and uh, get these things documented. Because if, um, when a project comes up, they don't know about it, it's a lot of times it'll be lost because of that. Yes. Marshall County this summer, and couldn't help but notice all of the marks I've One of the people with whom Jim spoke said that the laterals were growing after they went down, went all the way down under the Ohio River from the ridges. Is the mound in any way affected by the drilling that's going on all over the mound? That's my knowledge. That's a very first I've heard of this, but no, not, not to my knowledge. Probably because they're so far down, and that mound has been there for 2,000 years. It's, it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's fairly, fairly compact. And again, that, it is sandy soil, so I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yes? You mentioned that uh, Dr. Anavazio Meadowcroft is has interest with Grave Creek Mound, and we know that his uh, passion is less into the, the points, but more into the textiles. And I was just wondering if he's been able to shed any light on any of the more significant textiles that may have been found in the earlier cultures. Uh, not to my no, I'm not sure. Too early Sorry. yet. <laughs> yeah. But I will say that if you are, uh, Dr. Adamazio does uh, give guided lectures at Mud and several times a year. Have you all done those? Or? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm curious, your uh, legacy collections, now, about how long, did you say about 40 years? Oh, well, since about the 60s. And I'm curious, what sort of documentation? Oh, it's very, it's, oh my gosh, it's, it's very, very, very variable. Uh, some, some we have excellent documentation, others just a bag and something on it. And a lot of times we have to do triage, on the, we open the box up, it's like doing a triage, but these are paper bags. I mean, 1964, Dr. McMichael, did an analysis, you know, quick write up on it, put it back in the bag, close the box, and there's nothing looked at it since then. And he raised the bag up and the way the artifacts, it'll, you know, it'll fall out. So. I have a question. Uh, what is the process in uh, we, the Ohio Archaeological Survey, when we look at the And if it can be um, afforded, we can hire a consulting firm to come in, an archaeological consulting firm to come in and verify it for, you know, for, for people. And then also, I, I am a strong advocate for the archaeological conservancy. Uh, it's like the Nature Conservancy, and they will go in and they will acquire, you know, threatened or just, you know, they will, they'll take donations of archaeological sites, and they do a wonderful mission. There's also another one in, um, in Ohio, I think it's called the Heartlands uh, Archaeological Conservancy, where they're buying mounds and so forth in Ohio. We wanted to, to be able to assure the landowners that all we would want to do is just what you said, document them, just so that they are, if we believe they are, and we can have a professional, you know, do that investigation, right. and we could just document them for history's sake. And right. if they're on their property, by no means do we want to intrude, only to document them. Right. Now, one thing they can go a step further is like with the archaeological conservancy, they could help you, and you get like an easement on the, you know, the property, or it's their land, but no one can ever develop at that specific location. That's that's something that they're Who would we contact for Oh the easements. I would say check with the archaeological conservancy first, or the historic preservation office here at the culture center. I'm not really sure where the guys are on that. Okay. Sure. Oh I also want to add too um, uh, every year uh, this is about the fourth year they've had it, it's um it's, a, it's like a day in the life it's called a day of archaeology and our entire staff is great for some of our volunteers uh, around the whole world, Canada, South America, China, I mean, everywhere, uh, on that one day, you talk about and describe what it was you, you did that day in archaeology. It's pretty amazing, and uh, it was called the uh, Day of Archaeology. And then, uh, I just want to say, too, on October 19th, that's International Day of Archaeology, and that's another effort to try and pull people together in around the world you know, with archaeology. But anyway, on the handout I gave you, there's information on that. So. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I'm originally from Moundsville. Oh, okay. I used to play Cowboys and Indians on that mound. <laughs> for the fence. For the trees. Um, the oh, yes, yes. Jim Goodman over here. He was the same age. He played again. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you guys leave some of those marbles there? <laughs> Well, I was going to mention, too, that I, I, I left out the slide, but for a long time, you all will recall this from even Moundsville, every year at Christmas time, they decorated the heck out of the, uh, the mound with lights and reindeer and Santa Claus. So that ended about the mid-80s, mid I think, not much in D.C., but for a long time. I mean, it, I mean people, it was a thing, you know, it was like uh, uh, Wheeling's uh, uh, Bay's uh, Festival of Lights. I mean, with Moundsville's Festival of Lights. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about some of the more modern archaeological things that uh, you've been involved in, such as uh, the dig at uh, Independence Hall before they did some work there? Yeah, um, since uh, the Historic Ar Preservation Office archaeologists are all the way down here for three hours away, whenever things do take place that are on state property that our agency has oversight over, uh, and there are four of us that are trained in archaeology, we will go and, and, and kind of look, look after the archaeological needs. And a few years ago at Independence Hall, if you haven't been there, you need to go there, it's in Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, anyway, they, they were building a, uh, they dug a trench for a water suppression line, and we monitored that, and we went across what used to be a, a, someone's backyard, and we got a lot of early 19th century artifacts, you know, out of that trench, and that was, that was kind of neat. But it was just more of a monitoring and, and, and collecting what we could. When I, when I came to visit uh, Grave Creek the last time, that's what was in, on display in the laboratory. There was, you know, two tables full of all right. the little objects and bits and pieces that had been, been found there that had been processed through your lab. And we've uh, put together an exhibit at Independence Hall now with those artifacts that people can actually see it. What, what kinds of things did you have? Uh, mostly ceramics, but we did get a kale and pipe, uh, pipe holes. You go like the Williamsburg, you know, the, the pipes that were like this, where they would break real easy. We got lots of those, those would be fun. Uh, old window glass, flat glass. Um, we had pearlware, we had a little, I think a little bit of creamware, uh, bits, um, uh, shell edge. Uh, things, things like, a, lot of, a lot of ceramics. Were you in the privy? The privy? Yeah, well, when I was up at Harper's Ferry, they, the archaeologists always seemed to like it when they found a privy site. Yeah, Privies are gold mines. You know. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been in Henry Clay's privy. <laughs> in Kentucky, in Lexington, Kentucky, in Ashland. Uh, but yeah, they are gold mines because the way it is, they would um, use it for privy purposes, outhouse purposes, but then when they were using it, that was a convenient disposal for, for refuge, and it would typically you know, accumulate through time, like a time capsule. And you can learn a lot, you know, a lot of, uh, from from the from the outhouse uh, location. Would it be all right to ask you some high points in your career when you were in Virginia? We, my wife and I spent time at Williamsburg, and you, you know, oh, okay. a lot of interesting stuff's come out of Virginia, Southwest Virginia. I think you maybe did some time there. Did you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've done stuff in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, just you know, the mid 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 Atlantic area. Um, but anything, any kind of highlights? That, yeah, yeah, that's that lot. I mean, it's, it's all Henry Clay's proof, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Cathedral of Assumption in Louisville, there was that was that was very interesting there. Hmm. It's hard. I mean, it, it, I love it all. Yeah. Is there any uh, connection between like Moundsville there to like Marietta or some of the other sites that, that are associated with the Mountain? I think there is. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert enough to talk about that, but I'm, I'm fairly certain there are. Uh, not enough research has been done. I mean, there's not enough archaeologists, or actually, there's not enough money. To do pure research. I mean, a lot of the money for archaeology now is for when you build a highway or a pipeline or whatever. It's just what we need money is for real pure research, and that's that, that's that, that's the type of thing. Uh, unless you're a very strong av av avocational person, you do it on your own. But, but this is Archaeology Month, you know, and this is like, you know, go on the internet and find out what's going on around the world. It's amazing, especially here in the <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming to our uh, lecture tonight. Uh, we would like to remind you that there is some upcoming lectures. Uh, those are available on our website as far as the topics and also the speakers and the times for that. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.